would I be crazy to say SZA had one of the best albums of the year? Because she did. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst over at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. I guess we're going to have a bit of a shorter show today, only four games from Monday to break down. Happy New Year to everyone, by the way. Five games from Tuesday to preview. Maybe I'll sprinkle in a few other things in there as well. We're going to have the question of the day. We're going to have the player spotlight also. So let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. I might start off with something a little bit different. Just want to explain something that I didn't think I could get out there in a tweet. I put it out there today, and I probably shouldn't have tweeted it um, because it, it, it requires more explanation. I said I, I, I would prefer the I would like if the NBA would go to instead of having 13-man active rosters, to having 10-man active rosters. And the reason is a couple of reasons. I guess there's one selfish reason that uh, it stops coaches being as ridiculous with their with their rotations at times, um, with the exception of uh, Tom Thibodeau, of course. But also what it does is for guys, and it was prompted by me seeing Ivica Zubats in a game today for the first time in however long. He just sits on the bench and 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 doesn't play. And then he comes in and plays a couple of minutes in today's game. If you had a 10-man active roster limit, instead of having 13 with you know, two inactives, you can have 10 with five inactives. And those you can say, okay, well, I'm going to have these 10 guys and the other guys, you can go play in the G League for two or three weeks. And when you're ready to come and be a part of a 10-man rotation, you can come up and play rather than, oh, here's my 10-man rotation. You other three guys, you can just rot. You can just sit here and do nothing and, and don't play at all, play 30 seconds of garbage time in a game. Um, and and it, I think it's detrimental to their development. They're not getting you know, meaningful minutes in an NBA game. They're sitting on the bench. I would much prefer them to say, right, for the next two weeks, even if they 11, for the next two weeks, this is our 11-man roster. Um, you, know, you can call up a guy in case of injury, and those other guys can go play in the G League. It would strengthen the G League product, enable these guys to get consistent playing time. I'm sure there's other flaws to this uh, that I haven't thought through, but that was my main think, thinking uh, or thought process, I guess, when going through that and saying, hey, reduce the, a number of active spots that you need on the NBA. Then there's other guys, there's no way of keeping them around just in case, in case I need to play my eighth reserve guy for the day. And I think also part of it comes from you know, me being you know, raised on a sporting background here is that all the sports that we play here, there are way more starters on the field versus bench guys. In uh, in American sports, you have you know five guys on the ice in hockey, five guys on the court in basketball, eleven guys on the field in football. But you have your know, benches, which are, are at least that amount or double. Five guys starting, eight guys on the bench. In hockey, you have five guys starting, what, 15 guys on the bench. In football, 11 guys on the field at a time. Obviously, there's the offense-defense thing, but then you've got another 11, 11 to 20 guys on that side of the ball. Well, probably not 20, that's a little bit of an extreme example, but at least double the amount sitting on the bench as well. We play over here, you know, Australian rules football, 18 guys on the field at a time, four guys on the bench. You play cricket over here, 11 guys on the field, one reserve. And you can't even switch that guy in only in the case of, a, of an injury. And that's the only time that guy can come in. You, you play soccer, there's 11 guys on the field and you have you know, seven bench guys. Some leagues you have five bench guys. It's nearly always more guys active on the field versus fewer on the bench. And that was where my thought process was coming. And those guys who aren't required to just sit there and do nothing can go down and get some invaluable game experience. But that was uh, my thought behind that tweet. Let me know what you think if you have any uh, strong opinions either way. Again, when I talked about things like with the timeouts, it is hard for the guys in America to, to think about something in a different way. But that is the way that we do things over here with a lot of our sports. It's majority of people on the field, limited reserves rather than the, the US way of doing things. Five on, you know, five on the court, eight on the bench are more bench guys than actual um, active players. So that was uh, my thought process on that. Let's now get into the monstrous line of the night. And it goes to DeMar DeRozan of the Toronto Raptors. DeRozan broke the Raptors franchise record for points, beating um, Vince Carter and Terrence Ross. 52 points for DeMar. Five triples. 
five rebounds, eight assists, a steal, a block, 17 of 29 from the field. And of course, the brilliance of him from the line, 13 of 13. He has been phenomenal this season. And in large part, his increase, he was the 44th ranked player last season, but he is up to the 25th ranked guy this year because he is now hitting threes. He is at 1.1 per game over the course of the season, but over the last month, one and a half per game. Over the last two weeks, he has hit just uh, some 23s over his last seven games and shooting them at 53%. That's an unrealistic expectation, but for the season, 35%. For the last month, 43% from deep. And if he can add that on volume, which again, over this last month, three and a half attempts, and over the last two weeks, five and a half attempts per game, hitting them at a high rate, that brings a whole new dimension to what DeRozan can do. Bumps his true shooting up, his free throws are fantastic, gets to the line a ton, plus he's also averaging a full assist per game more than last season. So he just he is one of these guys that every single season brings something new to the table, and he's been really phenomenal for this team this season with the increased threes, with the increased passing, just really, really, and his efficiency, unbelievable, 48% from the field. True shooting of 58, that is absolutely fantastic on a usage of 30%. He has been a real, real star for Toronto, and I don't think many people realize just how much he's been able to improve his game this year. The waiver wire line of the night goes to the blue swimmer, Alan Crabb of the Brooklyn Nets. 15 points for Crabby, 8 boards, 1 assist, 3 triples a steal, and 3 blocks. He was only 3 of 8 from the field, but a perfect 6 of 6 from the line, and it's fair to say he has been bad. This season, he's ranked outside the top 150 this year, averaging just 11.7 points and two and a half threes, four rebounds. And this is the part of the thing when, when I talk about Crab is if he's if he's not hitting his shots at a high rate, what is he doing for you? And that's why I was never massively high on him. He averages four rebounds, under two assists, 0.7 steals, and his shooting has been terrible. 38% from the field this season and only 36% from three. And 36% from three is good. But when you're coming from a guy that shot 44 last year and 39 the year before, and that's your number one skill, if you're not hitting them at a high rate, then what's what benefit are you bringing? At this point, he is just a standard league uh, streamer. That is it. No must-own ability at all for him. And when D'Angelo Russell comes back, I think he loses more playing time, especially with how well Karis LeVert and Spencer Dinwiddie are playing. Maybe he takes some of Demario Carroll's minutes, but he just doesn't offer enough in any of those other categories. He's like a slightly better Doug McDirt in terms of he offers threes, and that's really it. And when the threes don't fall, there's not much else that comes from Alan Crabb. We saw him get big numbers today, mainly because of the blocks. You know, three blocks in a game is huge. And the eight rebounds, these are all massive outliers for Crab. Don't be getting looking at this and go, wave well on the night. I've got to go and add him. No, that's not the case. Sure, you need threes, absolutely. He can help you there, and he can bring in you know, two, three, four triples a game over a short period of time. But nothing else is really replicable from what he did today, the rebounding or the blocks. It's all quite fluky stuff, although weirdly over the last two games he has combined for five blocks. Prior to that, I think he didn't have a block in his... Uh, well, actually, let's if we go back and count them, this is great at podcasting. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. He had one block in his previous 18 games. That shows you just how weird it is for him to have five blocks in these two when he had one in the other 18 games. So really a, a huge outlier in terms of the production here from the Blue Swimmer, but he does get your waiver wire line of the night. The young gun of the night is... Thon McCurr of the Milwaukee Bucks, 16, 4, and 1 for Thon. Three threes, one steal, one block, four of eight from the field, and five of five from the line. He uh, played very, very well last season against the Raptors in the playoffs, and I thought maybe that was going to lead him to be a 24, 24 minute split this season with Greggy Munro. Didn't happen. Kid went back to playing a three center rotation, even with Munro gone. It's been uh, 10 games since McCurr has even cracked 20 minutes. And even in this game, with how well he played, he still only played 18 minutes. It's a good reminder that he can actually play well. He's been a real disappointment all season. And this isn't any indication that we need to rush and grab Thon or anything like that. But it is just a, it's a good reminder that he can play well. And he can be a guy that hits threes, gets blocks, and scores a little bit. But I don't have any real faith in him becoming even a top 200 guy this season. Maybe next season, if he heads into his third season, that's when a lot of players take a step forward. But I wouldn't be putting huge uh, bundles of money on him developing or kid trusting it. But he is your young gunner of the night. It is good to see that he still can do that. The dud of the night is the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma. He had six points, one rebound, and one assist with two triples. Two of seven from the field, zero of one from the line. He was part of that Lakers starting lineup that was pulled before they even scored a point as they got down 16 to nil 
against the Minnesota Timberwolves. He did exit to the locker room with some pain in his uh, thigh, another another hit in that thigh that, that cost him uh, or yeah, was going to limit him um, a few days ago, a week ago. But he was able to return to the game, but he just struggled. It just was a poor performance. I looked up his three-point shoot. Now, he's shooting 39.2% this season from three. Over his three seasons in college at Utah, he shot 30% from three, but he has taken more attempts in the NBA than he did across his three seasons at Utah, which is a a huge, huge improvement. And it it still makes me feel there is a level of regression coming here uh, with Kuzma's shooting. In fact, you know, I talked about this yeah, ad nauseum over the preseason where he shot 51%. I said, I don't think he's going to be able to shoot that. And of course, he's not because he's at 47%. But over the last two weeks, he's shooting 40% from the field, not from three, from the field. In fact, he's shooting 42% from three in that time, which is really high. And over the last month, he's at 44%. Um, yeah, high usage, but the, the, the true shooting numbers have come down. The field goal percentage has come down. He's still the 88th ranked player for the season and 75th over the last month, but you know, as I've talked about a lot, if, if the a lot of his value is coming from points, it's coming from and rebounding, which is strong. He's not doing anything steals and blocks wise. He's not getting assists, and his field goal percentage and free throw percentage it's not strong. His free throw percentage is not strong. He's only at seventy five percent from the field. While that's not terrible, it's still a below average contribution. I'm not saying anything about him being a guy to be dropped or anything along those lines, but he is putting up. Um, yeah, strong numbers. That there is just that level of I, I have a level of concern with, with him. I, I guess that's the best way of me putting it. Just with that with that shooting and the, the I guess I just I just don't feel that it's one hundred percent real at this point. I know plenty of people will dis disagree with me. I, I just I just don't feel that it's at this level. I don't feel it's as real as what we've seen so far. But yeah, not denying that he should be owned in any leagues. Of course, I also I do think that his ceiling. For fantasy is limited. I don't think he'll ever become a top 40 player or a top 30 guy. I think he can have multiple top 70 seasons, maybe a couple of top 50s. I don't ever think he can push much higher than that, though. But he has been, obviously, super impressive so far this season. All right, before we get into the question of the day and looking at these games in more detail, remember to stay tuned to check out the Player Spotlight after the break and before we get into the DFS action where we will preview all five games for DFS. Let's now go to the the question of the day. And uh, who does this one come from from today's show? It comes from The Triant, who's on Twitter at The Triant. He says, what was the best movie series game you watched in 2017. I've So I broke this up um, into three categories, movie, TV series, and uh, game, as in uh, video game. That's what I assume that the trend is asking. As I said, this question of the day, it can be basketball related, it can be life related, it can be fantasy related, and I've, I think I've spread it out amongst those categories with the question of the day. So I hadn't been to many movies really until the second half of this season, really hadn't uh, had the opportunity to go out, but I started to go to quite a few more. And I, the best movie that I've seen, I am uh, I guess I'm uh, restricting this to movies that I've seen in cinema, I really enjoyed uh, Thor Ragnarok. I thought it was fantastic. Clearly the best of the Thor, th- the three Thor movies, in my opinion. I, I do enjoy the Marvel movies. Uh, I think I've seen, I think I've seen every one bar one, which I really need need to get around and seeing uh, Doctor Strange, which I haven't seen yet. But Thor, I thought was uh, it was fun. It was funny. It was bright. It was uh, it was loud. It was interesting. It was engaging, and probably one of the best Marvel movies that we've seen in the last couple of couple of years. So yeah, big on the big on the Marvel movies. So I'd say Thor Ragnarok was my movie of the year. Not that I saw. A huge amount, but that would be the best one that I saw. Uh, I could also include the Last Jedi in there, which I was uh, I was pretty impressed with. But Thor just narrowly pipped that for TV. Watch a lot more TV than movies in terms of series I watched this year. This is probably sacrilegious, but I I had never watched Curb, Enth- Curb Your Enthusiasm until this year. I'd seen maybe two or three episodes, and what you know what? It's coming back. Let's go go bang on it and and binge it all. And I watched all nine seasons in about a month's time, maybe. Um, so yeah, that was that was massive to watch all all of Curb in that in that time frame. Better Call Saul was fantastic. Really, really loved that. Uh, and a couple of animated shows that I thought were massive for me this year. Like I really enjoyed BoJack Horseman and uh, the first season of Big Mouth, which was uh, which debuted on Netflix this season. That was awesome as well. So they're they're my four best TV shows of the year. I'm currently in the middle of watching the marvelous Mrs. Maisel at the moment. I've watched uh, two episodes of that. Watched that last night. So we'll see how that goes. That's a it's an Amazon uh, show, I believe. Uh, so watching that at the moment, uh, and uh, if you've 
let me know what you think of that, but I'll, I'll give my report back on that at some point once I'm done with it, which I imagine will be in the next couple of days. As for video games, I mainly play sport video games, so FIFA, NBA, um, played a bit of uh, Gran Turismo, which I got uh, over the Christmas period, played some of that yesterday with uh, with Ben. But I, Ben Ben got a Nintendo Switch for his birthday. I was trying to convince him, no, get a PlayStation, get a PlayStation, because now I want a Switch. Got it, got Mario Kart 8. It's the best. I love it. it I, I consider I'm going to buy a Switch just so I can play Mario Kart 8. Brings back all the memories of playing it back on the Nintendo 64. Absolutely fantastic game. It's so much fun. I know everyone would have played Mario Kart and loves it, but it was super fun. So I reckon that's probably my game of the year. And uh, it was something that I tried to dissuade him from uh, from getting. But Mario Kart 8 is my game of the year of what I've played. Now, let's get in back into talking about basketball and uh, and talk about these games in some more detail. The first game we're going to take a look at is, uh, where is it? It's the Minnesota, no, it's not. It's the Milwaukee Bucks and the Toronto Raptors. Eric Bledsoe, another big game from him. He's been fantastic since joining Milwaukee. 29-7-3, five triples and four steals. He's got a really good record against Toronto and showed that again here. Shot efficiently, six of six from the line, 60% from the field, 71% from three. Just a monster from him. While Yanni had 26-9-7. The defensive numbers have been lacking for Adedokounmpo recently, but still, those other numbers are pretty impressive. While Chrissy Middleton had 18-3-2 and two and brought the defensive numbers. It was good to see Malcolm Brogdon playing 39 minutes in an overtime game while Tone Snell only played 18 minutes and that because that's because Brogdon is better than Tone Snell now I'm, I'm not Jason Kidd clearly uh, and Kidd obviously doesn't believe that but Brogdon is a better player than Tone Snell it, it should be as clear as as anything that Brogdon is that guy he's the guy you should hold but have little faith or consistency in what Kidd is going to do he had 15 6 and 2 in his 39 minutes and it just goes to show how absolutely ludicrous it was that Brogdon didn't play at all in that first half bar the final three minutes with that kid bullshit that he pulled last week. Delivered over played 29 minutes the Bucks went with a lot of three point guard lineups I don't fully agree with that Delivered over still had five rebounds and 10 assists but he shouldn't be playing 29 minutes while the uh, the sexy boy Sean Kilpatrick He had five points in 10 minutes. He's not really a fantasy option in any leagues, but it is interesting to see that DeAndre Liggins, who Kidd was, whatever reason, giving the uh, perpetual Dutch rudder to, is now out of the rotation. Try and work that out. I, I, I definitely can't. On to the Raptors. I talked about DeRozan, but Lowry was strong as well. 26-6-6 and six with five triples, a steal, a block, super efficiency, 41 minutes, while Serge Ibaka returned from his one-game suspension. And he'd been a little bit quiet since having that knee problem, but 11-8, and eight, but the defensive numbers. Two steals and four blocks, and he shot horribly, which he did against Milwaukee all the time in the playoffs. 26% on 19 shots is abysmal. But those defensive numbers are really sexy. Storm and Norman Powell, actually a DNP CD. He has fallen uh, at a tremendous, tremendous rate because the Jedi OG Ananobi has been good. And for a guy that scored one point, did not take a single shot, he played 35 minutes because his defense is that good. Still really struggling to get the block numbers after blocking a ton of shots in college. I think they will come at some point, but he is locked into that starting role and he is not giving it up any time in the future. Six rebounds and two assists for the Jedi. CJ Miles had eight points. He is a three-point streamer, while my man DeLon Wright brings the defense yet again, a steal and two blocks, and he has value in 12-team leagues. Consider him an Andre Robertson that does have a an element of an offensive game. Not quite maybe the volume of stats that Robertson can give you, but he can give you, a D-line can give you assists there as well. Jakob Pertl, four and two in 17 minutes, while Valanchunas just 16 minutes. I'm going to make a bold proclamation. I'm not, it, it probably isn't actually bold at all. I think Jakob Pertl is the starting center for the Raptors next season. His numbers from this year look uh, look really, really appealing in terms of him progressing into a, a, a decently high-quality starting center. I don't think he'll ever be a 33-minute-per-game guy, more maybe a 26 to 27 guy at some point, and he can have some real fantasy value. So if you are in a dynasty league and you've got the ability to try and acquire someone, I think that Pirtle is a very, very nice option. I do like Baby Noguera, but he's out of the rotation. I don't think he's really going to get back in. But if they get uh, get themselves out of the Jonas Valanciunas business, Bebe in a 20-minute backup role with Pirtle playing 28, both of those guys could be top 100 fantasy guys. So that is uh, something interesting to pay attention to. But a lot of the uh, advanced numbers from Pirtle are really impressive, and I think they're going to take a, a big leap next season. That's uh, just some, some earlier early thoughts for next season. 
the Orlando Magic and the Brooklyn Nets. Bismack Biombo, only 29 minutes for Biombo, but 13 points, 17 rebounds, and three blocks. He's pulling in pretty much every available rebound, it feels like, for the Magic and getting lots of uh, blocked shots. And I guess the surprise here is the fact that he went five of six from the free throw line. He is a must own if you need rebounds and blocks. Um, and the free throws can be dicey, but it was an impressive night. While Lord Alfred Payton, his owners will be pleased to see him go for 17, 4, and 7 with two steals and a block in a game that Aaron Gordon and Evan Fournier both played in. That was, I guess, a, a, a level of concern with uh, with Payton, but putting up some uh, good numbers here as Gordon had 20 and 12 in his 41 minutes in the three-point percentage. Wasn't quite there in this one. Two of eight for 25%. Fournier had 13 points with a steal and a block. Not a good, efficient night from him, while John Simmons was worse. 10-5-3 on 25% shooting. He has been really poor lately. You know my thoughts on Simmons. I don't think he's very good. I think he's overrated by a large portion of the basketball community and fantasy basketball as well. He's actually the 161st ranked player for this season. He's 190th over the last two weeks, shooting 36%. So much of his early season value was based on really high usage and extraordinarily high true shooting percentage and efficiency, which were two things that I th- thought were, were bound to regress. And they have, because over that last two weeks, he's got a usage of just 20, which is down from his 24% over the course of the season. And his true shooting is down to 44%, where it's at 54% on the season. Now, it will probably come back up. He was at 50% last year. But I, I just don't value him as a... He's, he's a guy you probably should own. I, he probably should be. But in a 10-team league, I wouldn't be considering him a must-own guy. And in a 12, I probably would, but it really does depend on the rest of your team. Um, Mario Hazonia into this six-man role. Of course, you can drop him in any 12-team leagues and probably 14-team leagues as well. Now, on to the Brooklyn Nets. My boy, Karis Levert, only 27 minutes, but doesn't matter. 15, 5, and 8, two steals. He is as must-own as they come if he is on your waiver wire, which he probably is considering he's only in only 41% of leagues. Please grab him. It's going to be very interesting when D'Angelo Russell comes back with Crab, with Levert, with Dinwiddie. Who cops the biggest hit? Um, Levert is just playing so well. He is just running this team along with Hollis Jefferson a lot of the time, and he is a real future piece for them. So it's going to be interesting to see how they handle it. But for now, you got to own him. While Jared Allen, with uh, Jaleel Okafor set to return in the next game, Allen said, well, you know what? I can do offense as well. 16 points on eight shots, six boards and two blocks. He has by far got the best chance to be a 12-team league player ahead of Okafor, ahead of AC, ahead of Tyler Zeller, ahead of Tim Mozgov out of these centers. Not sure he's going to do it, but if you want to take a flyer and see what happens over the next three to four weeks, Allen is an interesting guy. I don't think he loses much playing time when Okafor returns. Tyler Zeller and AC will be the, the more likely candidates to do that. And someone asked me today with Okafor returning in the next game, do I add him? No, you don't. They said he's going to play in really short bursts. He's terrible. He would need 30 minutes to be a top 100 player, in my opinion, and I cannot see any situation in which he plays 30 minutes a game. Allen's the better player, the better fit for this team, and the better fit for the future of the NBA. So, um, yeah, Allen is, a, is a definitely an interesting guy. Hollis Jefferson, 13 and 7, a steal and a block, inefficient, but he is really taking on a large role for this team. Well, Damari Carroll had struggled, but it was nice to see him get a 14 and 10 double double. He is more of a 14 team must own, but definitely can be a 12 team league player. The LA Lakers and the Minnesota Timberwolves, just a horrendous start from the Lakers. So all those all their starters got benched after that 16-0 run. Julius Randle was good once more, 15-12 and 12 with a steal and a block in 28 minutes. It would be absolutely maddening, insane, um, malpractice coaching if Randle is moved to the bench before Brook Lopez returns. We will see what Luke Walton does, but I cannot see him doing that. 15 and 12, 60% shooting, steal and a block, good numbers from Randall and a clear must-own guy, while Larry Nance under 20 minutes again, 6 and 4 with two steals. I don't think that Nance is getting the starting job back even when Lopez returns. I think we'll be running Kuzma out there, and I think they should continue to see what they've got in a Kuzma Randall front court. There's no need for a Nance Lopez front court, not that they've been playing super well, but I think you want to develop Kuzma in that role and Randall at center just to see what can happen. Jordy Clarkson off the bench, 24 minutes, 20 points, 4 assists, 47% shooting, insane usage. Lonzo Ball could be back in the next game, so that's going to impact Clarko. But the fact that he, in the last two games, hasn't even reached 30 minutes without Lonzo is not a fantastic sign for me as we move forward. You own him, but definitely he's not going to be... I I don't think he's going to be labeled a must-own guy for the entirety of the season. Brandon Ingram, 14-5 and in 29 minutes, not a great performance, the shooting... Still a bother for him, while the Josh the Hitman Hart. All 
Ah, uh, yes. Wasn't the greatest night from the Hitman. I just wanted to play that song again. 10 points in 21 minutes with two triples. He was part of that group of starters who got pulled off pretty early by Walton and never really recovered. With KCP likely back in the next game, or not likely back, KCP will be back in the next game, and Lonzo likely back, then uh, Hart's value is going to dissipate. I think he can maintain a 20-minute value. That's probably unlikely to be a 12-team league sort of guy. Also worth mentioning with Kuzma, actually, I did mention it with Kuzma, that he copped that... Um, Cop that uh, that knee in the in the thigh. He said that he might be. He doesn't know of his status for Wednesday's game, so that could open up more playing time for Nance there. But of course, with so many games on Wednesday, adding Nance, you're probably not even going to be able to use him. For the Minnesota Timberwolves, Jim Butler, 37 minutes, 28, three and nine, three steals and a block. The absence of Jeff Teague is making him play point guard a lot. Uh, Tyus Jones got into early foul trouble. That's why his minutes were only at 27. It wasn't because Aaron Brooks played well, because he didn't. Only 14 minutes for Brooks with an assist and a steal. I don't even think he should be in the rotation at all, to be honest, Brooks. Let Crawford, let Butler handle backup point guard roles, play more Marcus George's hunt. There's no reason for Brooks to be in at all. But I don't think that, because Brooks is a Tibbs guy, that's why he was brought over, because three years ago, he played well as a reserve point guard. So Tibbs went, you know what, must, must make him still good, even though he was dreadful last season. As for Jones, only five points, but the stats that you knew that he was going to bring, he still brought them. Five assists, three steals in 27 minutes. With Jeff T continually dressing and sitting on the bench being active but not playing, it, it does give you the idea that he's going to be back on the two-week end of that four-week schedule, and that means that Jones' value is going to be limited uh, long-term, but the assists and steals are still really nice. Gorgie Jeng played well, 17-4 and four in 22 minutes. I've never doubted what he can do in terms of ability-wise. It's more like, where does he get those minutes? And he got extra playing time because Carl Anthony Towns was in foul trouble too. 27 minutes for Towns. He's 16-13 and 13 with two steals and a block. Nemanja Bielitsa played 15 minutes, so he's ramping his playing time back up there as well. The last game of the night, the Portland Trailblazers and the Chicago Bulls, another overtime game, our second of the day. Evan Turner, 38 minutes for Turner, 22 points, four rebounds, six assists, a steal, a three. Yeah, sometimes we just don't know. You get terrible Evan Turner, you get yeah, good Evan, Evan Turner. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Yep, that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, who Evan Turner is. I wouldn't be getting too much excitement out of this performance or going to add him, of course. While El Farouk Aminu, another one of these games where he hits five threes. He was five of seven from three, 24 points, seven boards. He's really up and down. You cannot expect this consistently. He's done it enough where you go, well, what's going on? Why is he shooting the ball so well? But there's also going to be a big stretch where he's just terrible. He's fine in 12s. I wouldn't be you know, grasping onto him with, uh, with all my hope that he's going to continue to do this. 38 minutes from Yusuf Nurkic. 11-15, three steals, two blocks. I legitimately had people, oh, should I drop Yusuf Nurkic? Like, no, I, I couldn't have stressed enough. No, you shouldn't. He is going to be better, and he was much better here. While McCollum had 32-6-8 and eight after a really, really poor start. He turned it on late. Shabazz Napier, not his best game. 11-5-6 and six in 41 minutes is good. 23% shooting isn't good. Now, the questions, of course, flow in. What do I do with Napier when Lillard's back, which is likely going to be the next game? There's a couple of things to mention here. Is it Dame Lillard said, yeah, he's probably going to be ready to go Tuesday. But remember, he said that last week when he said, I'm going to be ready to play on Thursday and then didn't play and then didn't play across the weekend and then didn't play today. So I'll believe Lillard out on the court when I see it. If they do announce Dame Lillard is ready to go, I wouldn't immediately drop Shabazz because coming back from a hamstring issue, which I'm going to talk about hamstrings in, in a sec, coming back from a hamstring injury, he might not play his 36. He might play 30, and they might play. They might get smashed by the Cavs, and they might play Napier some more minutes. So with a five-game slate only on Tuesday, hang on to Shabazz. See how it goes. See what happens here. He should be able to get 20 regardless as that third guard takes some minutes away from Pat Connaughton, and he might even get to 26 or 27 if they do limit Dame. So don't be... um. Don't be too quick to go and drop him. For the Bulls, Chrissy Dunn picked up yeah, early fouls, three three offensive fouls uh, early on. That's not ideal. He had eight turnovers, also not ideal. But this counting stats, a triple one, 22 points, seven rebounds, four assists, a horrendous shot at the end of the game. And these sort of things is why I, I, he, he's not a good point guard yet. He's really good for our fantasy point of view, like a top 50 guy recently, putting up these counting stats. But on a good team, on a really good team, oh, he just has too many poor decision moments. That uh, that yeah, poor shots, poor turnovers, poor decisions in general. That he, that I feel is really going to limit him long term. He was always in this great opportunity to put up counting stats. The efficiency has been a big surprise to me, but still some poor decisions, which at some point 
is going to limit him. I don't think he'll ever be an all-star caliber point guard. I'm not ever sure I'll say he's a top 15 point guard in the NBA. But for us now, love it. Nick Miritich, just the 19 minutes for Miritich because he is the best player, so he had to play limited minutes. 18 and 10 with two triples. He was killing it. And Hoiberg's reasoning. Now, I'd been, um, I guess, full of praise for what Hoiberg's done this season, but this is bullshit. Oh, we didn't play him out there because uh, of Nurkic. Huh? Play, play Miritich. Miritich actually outplayed Nurkic and played you know, half the minutes that he played. Make them adjust. Make Nurkic try and switch out. Put the Miritich marking and front court out there. Make make uh, Yusuf go out there and guard space. The Bulls had the lead late and, and choked it away to the Blazers. Miritich you know, still should be owned. The 19 minutes is clearly frustrating, but that's a fantastic performance. He's their best player. He was comf- I think he was comfortably their second best player last season after Jim Butler, but was dicked around all season. Um... I just don't know what, what what to make of this. It's a bullshit excuse from Hoiberg, and I've been pretty I've been full of praise for him, but this was not a good idea. Market in 34 minutes, 19 and 8 with four triples, while Robin Lopez, the man who stayed in and played down the stretch, he was he was alright, 15, 6, and 5 in 36 minutes, but he shouldn't be getting 36 minutes at this point in the season, especially when he's only shooting 38% and taking 16 shots, which just seems just ridiculously too high. Denzel the Hammer Valentine, 10, 7, and 6. While David Nwaba started the second half in front of him, that did not last long as Valentine came in, closed out the game, and look, put up some okay numbers. And he is a fine streamer for a day like today, but really not a guy that I want to hold on to in all 12-team type leagues. That uh, wraps up the action from New Year's Day. I am going to take a quick break now, and then we're going to come back and we're going to look at the player spotlight, and then we're going to go into previewing a five-game NBA Tuesday and I'll do that with a song from, who am I going to put this one uh, from? Let's uh, let's go to Con Etiquette. And the uh, song is called 1, 2, 3, 4. And then we'll be back to talk some DFS. Would I be crazy to say SZA had one of the best albums of the year? Because she did. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst over at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. I guess we're going to have a bit of a shorter show today, only four games from Monday to break down. Happy New Year to everyone, by the way. Five games from Tuesday to preview. Maybe I'll sprinkle in a few other things in there as well. We're going to have the question of the day. We're going to have the player spotlight also. So let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. I might start off with something a little bit different. Just want to explain something that I didn't think I could get out there in a tweet. I put it out there today, and I probably shouldn't have tweeted it um, because it, it, it requires more explanation. I said I, I would prefer the, I would like if the NBA would go to, instead of having 13-man active rosters, to having 10-man active rosters. And the reason is a couple of reasons. I guess there's one selfish reason that uh, it stops coaches being as ridiculous with their with their rotations at times, um, with the exception of uh, Tom Thibodeau, of course. But also what it does is for guys, and it was prompted by me seeing Ivica Zubats in a game today for the first time in, in however long. He just sits on the bench and 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 doesn't play, and then he comes in and plays a couple of minutes in today's game. If you had a 10-man active roster limit, instead of having 13 with you know, two inactives, you can have 10 with five inactives, and those you can say, okay, well, I'm going to have these 10 guys, and the other guys, you can go play in the G League for two or three weeks, and when you're ready to come and be a part of a 10-man rotation, you can come up and play, rather than, oh, here's my 10-man rotation, you other three guys, you can just rot, you can just sit here and do nothing, and, and don't play at all, play 30 seconds of garbage time in a game, um, and, and I think it's detrimental to their development, they're not getting you know, meaningful minutes in an NBA game, they're sitting on the bench, I would much prefer them to say, right, for the next 
two weeks, even if they 11, for the next two weeks, this is our 11-man roster. Um, you, know, you can call up a guy in case of injury, and those other guys can go play in the G League. It would strengthen the G League product, enable these guys to get consistent playing time. I'm sure there's other flaws to this uh, that I haven't thought through, but that was my main think, thinking uh, or thought process, I guess, when going through that and saying, hey, reduce the, a number of active spots that you need on the NBA. Then there's other guys, there's no way of keeping them around just in case, in case I need to play my eighth reserve guy for the day. That's kept him out for eight months. Joining a new team, fitting in with a new team. We saw players like Jimmy Butler who came into the season fully healthy, try and work out what the hell was going on with a new team when he was comfortably their best player. Thomas moves in and is not their best player in Cleveland. So you have to adjust with playing next to LeBron James. He's not going to have the ball in his hands as much as what he had it in uh, in Boston. So getting a usage of 33%, but more importantly, getting to the line 8.5 points uh, times per game is going to be really tough. His previous three seasons, 5.7, uh, that was in Sacramento and Phoenix, uh, sorry, yeah, that was in Sacramento. The next season, Boston and Phoenix, 5.2. And his full, first full season in Boston, only 6.6. So it was a massive, massive increase last season as he really elevated himself to be the go-to guy. And that, I just don't think that's going to be the case. At least it won't be for the first six weeks or so. Maybe LeBron you know, steps off end of March and, and eases back. But we heard this from LeBron, you know, people talking about LeBron. Oh, he's going to really step back and, and give everything to Kyrie and let Kyrie be the main guy. And it just doesn't happen. That's just not what LeBron does. LeBron still runs things. LeBron's still the best player in the NBA, and he still runs everything. So I would imagine his free throw attempts would come down. Now, last season, the number one category for Isaiah Thomas was his free throw percentage. He had a standard score, a Z score of 2.69 in that category, while his scoring was 2.44. So when the assist, well, the uh, free throw attempts drop, that drops his value there. It also drops his points down as well. I don't imagine he's keeping a usage of 34%. And I think that we, there might be some regression as he gets his legs back under him, adjusts to a new team in terms of his shooting percentages. It dial all that in with the fact that he played 34 minutes per game last season, and it's probably not going to be able to average that in the remaining three and a half months of this season. Then your expectations of him sh this season should be really muted. I think if he was to finish as a top 20 player this season, I would be stunned. I think a top 25 is a possibility. And I think that for the month of January, you should be expecting him to play limited minutes. At least for these first two to three weeks, I would expect him to be you know, getting 20 minutes a night, 18 minutes a night. They said he's going to play 20 tomorrow, and that's fine. I think that'll be the case for the first two weeks or so. And then he'll push into the 30, 32 minute mark in late January, early February. But even then, when he gets his full minutes, it won't be the same Isaiah Thomas we saw uh, last season. I think a, a more realistic expectation February onwards is look back to what he did in 15-16. 32 minutes a night, 22 points, 3 rebounds, 6 assists, 2 triples, a steal. Um, yeah, 43% from the field, that could probably go up. 87% uh, from the line on 6.6 .6 free throw attempts. That's a more realistic expectation for Isaiah Thomas this season than what we saw from him last year. He was putting up historic stretches of shooting and usage, which had never been seen in NBA history before. So to expect him to repeat that, a year older, serious injury, new team, ball-dominant teammate, it's a hard pill for me to swallow. So I, I don't think it'll be the case. Um, if you are looking to trade for him, I wouldn't be doing it based on what happened last season. I'd reset my expectations to, you know, if I was trying to acquire him in a trade, I'd be looking at saying, well, worst case scenario, he's probably, uh, worst case, the 50th ranked guy from here on out, w worst case. And it'll be worse than that over the first month. That would be my expectation, worst case scenario when I'm considering trading. Now, he might jump up, but where's his ceiling? I don't think it's top 15. It's definitely not top 10. Uh, I think we're talking about top 25. Now, he, he proved me wrong plenty of times last season, eventually did drop off towards the end of the year, and he could do it again. But that's the way that I look at it with him. If you've, if you've got him on your IR spot, he's got 22 minutes to play here against Portland, then he doesn't play on Wednesday. It's fine if you want to activate him because even though he will sit out Wednesday, we've got, a, I think it's a 12-game slate on Wednesday, so you may not even need to use him or that roster spot on that, that stage. Anyway, I'm generally someone who, who just like to you just, just leave him on that IR spot for one game. If he's got a 20-minute limit, it's unlikely he's going to blow up. So I'd probably just leave him in that IR spot. But with a, a five-game slate on, just to get some extra games and totally understand activating him, he would be one of those guys in this situation that I would activate at, or that I would consider activating immediately out of the IR spot. So in a dynasty league, I, I do think that he will never get back to that level from last season. Again, we're talking about a guy that, that's hitting age 29, going to be 30 next year, unknown in terms of where he ends up. 
I think we've seen the best of Isaiah Thomas. He's proved plenty of people wrong. He's a tough bastard, and he's probably going to be one of proving everyone's wrong who is doubting him. But it is a tough situation for him, and there are a lot of unknowns. So that does limit my uh, my faith in what he can do as we move forward. The perfect DFS lineup from Monday on Fangio: Kyle Lowry 45.2 and Eric Bledsoe 48.9. DeRozan had 74. And Wigo had 46.8, Evan Turner 37.8, and Jim Butler 50.1, Serge Barker 39.6, while Nikola Mirotic in 18 minutes had 35 Fangio points, and Nurkic 42.6 for a total of 420, and that cost 59,900. DraftKings, CJ McCollum 51, Eric Bledsoe 50.25, DeRozan 75.75, Aminu 36.25, Biombo 41.25, Turner 38, Wigo 44.75, and Lowry 47.5 for a total of 384.75, and that cost $48,900. Dudes, let's talk DFS. We've got five games on, as I mentioned already. The first one of those is the Portland Trailblazers, the only team on a back-to-back taking on the Cleveland Cavaliers. We know that Isaiah Thomas is ready to go. Damian Lillard is questionable. As I said earlier, he said that he was going to be ready to go, but we have heard that before. But I just got a tweet from, uh, I should bring up who, I think it was uh, Dan Morang, who tweeted me, said that CJ McCollum had said, if I am a fantasy owner, I would start Dame tomorrow. So that's a, that's a positive there. Of course, players aren't always to be trusted in their evaluations of injuries. Not many of them have uh, sports medicine degrees. So I wouldn't be fully invested in that, but I think you should feel a decent level of confidence in Dame coming back. Now, whether that's going to be applicable for DFS, I wouldn't want to use it outside of a GPP. He is priced at 8900 on Fangio, but it's a tasty matchup. Point guards, backcourt players against the Cavs have feasted all season. Lillard averages 43 points the last three times he's taken on the Cavs. Isaiah Thomas, Jose Calderon, backcourt combination. Not really going to be a huge um, not an impediment to Lillard if he's at full steam ahead, but coming back from a hamstring injury, that can be tough. I was, I was supposed to talk about Jim Harden's hamstring. I am going to talk about that very shortly after this game. We might get into that. 8,900 for Lillard is a GPP sort of a guy. As for Thomas, 5,500. That's a very cheap price for Isaiah. He's only going to be playing here 20, 22 minutes. Um, can he exceed that? Yeah, absolutely he can. But of course, I don't think you want to use that in a cash game scenario. Well, Shabazz Napier at 6,500 is just, there's no way unless Lillard is out. If Lillard is out, I'm back on Napier. If Lillard plays, I don't think there's any way you can use that. At shooting guard, the plumber, J.R. Smith, $4,000, only a GPP guy, and he has been quite poor lately. Well, Dwayne Wade at 4,900 has done very well against Portland in the past. But with Thomas and Calderon both playing, some of his ball handling may be reduced. Might not be, but maybe, uh, And that's going to limit what Wade can do. McCollum's at 7,100. I'm in on him if Lillard is out. If Lillard is back, uh, more of a GPP sort of a guy. While uh, Kyle Corver at 35 minimum salary can give you 25. Maybe a tournament, but not strongly feeling on that. At small forward, LeBron James, 11,500. LeBron James. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty good with LeBron there. You feel pretty confident. Conf, com, try it again. Confident with 50 points from LeBron. Yeah, 65 point upside. Pretty comfortably here. I uh, feel pretty good about using LeBron there. Evan Turner at 3700 was obviously fantastic today, but that's uh, an unrealistic expectation. Prior to today's game, he'd averaged 15 points in his past five in 25 minutes. So maybe in a tournament, but getting back to back big games from Evan Turner seems tough. El Farouk Aminu was a monster, 5,300. He is quite up and down with what he can do, but he's got that uh, GPP ability, not a cash guy. Eddie Davis, Jay Crowder, not interested in them. Jeff Green at 4,600 as well. My name is Jeff. Not really feeling too much there from him. At center, Yusuf Nurkic, 6,500. I'm in on Nurkic here. I do fear that maybe Terry Stotts pulls him a little bit if they go with a lot of love at center, which I think they might go less love at center with Isaiah Thomas back, play a bit more Tristan Thompson. But Nurkic is is worth a look, especially at that salary, whereas I love at 7,900. He has lit up the Blazers in the past. He is more of a tournament guy, just with us not being sure how they're going to run that rotation with Thompson back and with the usage going, some of that towards uh, to, towards Isaiah. So at 7,900, he's a little bit tough to use in cash, in my opinion. Now, uh, let's head across to uh, DraftKings and talk about that one. Um, 
I really like LeBron here again, 11,700. That's strong for cash and tournaments. While McCullum at 7,300 is is a play if Lillard is out. Otherwise, he's a tournament guy. And Nurkic at 7,000. Now, that's too high, but I do still think he's got 40-point upside, so that makes him worth a look in a tournament. Of course, we look at Alfred Aminu at 4,500. That is a very interesting option. Uh, but again, I wouldn't feel great about using him in cash, but I'd feel better about using him in cash on DraftKings than I would at Fangio. Well, Lillard, the same concerns are here. He is at 8,500. So a similar type price point, which makes him yes, similarly interesting. Now, I did mean to talk about this earlier, but I'm going to talk about it now. James Harden has been diagnosed with a grade 2 hamstring strain, and he will be reevaluated in two weeks. This does not mean that Jim Harden will be back in two weeks. In fact, I would be pretty stunned if he is back by the end of January. This is an injury that can linger to six to eight weeks. I think a three to four week estimation is probably more of a realistic scenario. So don't expect Harden back in two weeks. I would be floored if he is back. A grade one hamstring, which is similar to what Lillard's got, has kept him out a week. This is a much more significant injury for Harden. It's not the Solomon Hill, Chris Middleton hamstring that keeps you out for four to six months with surgery. It doesn't require surgery, but it's going to take a long time to heal. So I would be expecting, I would be bracing for four weeks absence from Harden. Now, a lot of people asking me the question, who's the guy you add? Well, we know what D'Antoni does. You're going to play a lot more minutes from Chrissy Paul. He played 41 minutes in that game against the Lakers in an overtime game. So he is going to get a lot of minutes. Eric Gordon's going to be playing here 38 to 40 minutes. Trevor Ariza is going to play big minutes. And Luke Marmute is going to be back. He can play a little bit at the two, but more PJ Tucker will go there too. Now, the question is Gerald Green. Do we go and add Gerald Green? Gerald Green's really a guy that can add three pointers. And that's really about it. And given the fact that I think that Eric Gordon's going to play 38 minutes, I think Chrissy Paul's going to play 36 to 37 minutes, and there's only 96 minutes available in that backcourt, there's just not enough playing time there for for Green to be a guy that I think is a must-add player. Sure, on a low-volume night, you can stream him in and get some threes, but there's just not going to be enough playing time there. Now, they they could also run with Briante Weber ahead of Gerald Green because, of course, Jim Harden was handling all the point guard job until uh, when Chris Paul was off the court and vice versa. When um, when Paul was out, we saw Weber come in and play 16 to 17 minutes to give Harden a spell. Now, do they run Eric Gordon there at the point guard? I'm not so sure they will. I think that we'll see some Weber in there, and that's going to impact what Gerald Green can do. Of course, we won't know until they see the court for the first time, but so those backup guard minutes, we're going to have Paul, we're going to have Gordon, and then it's going to be Green and Weber. And whether they want to run Gordon at point guard is going to have a big, big bearing on what Gerald Green can do, because if they can't run uh, him at point guard, if they don't want to run Gordon at point guard, then Weber is going to have to get in there. And with Ma Mute due back in the next couple of games, that takes away some wing minutes away from Green as well. So he's not a strong ad. PJ Tucker is not a strong ad. It's Eric Gordon if he was available, but not much changes. It just means more minutes to these other guys or more minutes to players who aren't going to be fantasy relevant. So it sucks. There's no real huge winner here. Sure, in a 16-team league, take a flyer on Jez. But that's really about it. And realistically, he's a guy that might be able to hit you two, two and a half threes in this time frame, but not maybe 10 points, 12 points. But he's not playing massive, massive minutes. The big minutes go to Gordo. They go to Chris Paul, Trevor Ariza. You get more out of Marmute, a bit more out of Tucker. And it's going to be a toss-up to see what Weber or Green can come in there, or maybe they split the minutes. We will see. They meant to include that part uh, of the show a little bit earlier on, so I do apologize for that. The San Antonio Spurs... And the New York Knicks, back to DFS. The Spurs are favored by four points. The total is the lowest of the day. It's pretty ugly, 199.5. Kawhi Leonard is listed as probable as he returns from his injury. He played 29 minutes in that last game, so I'd expect him to be pushing towards 30, 31 here. So it is uh, you know, obviously trending in the right direction for him. Overall, this game is not an ideal one for DFS. At point guard, you've got Patrick Mills at minimum salary 3,500, and that's because he's averaging under 12 points in the last five in 21 minutes per game. Sure, he's got that upside to go out there and hit some threes, but I, I am not excited, even though the matchup's a good one. While Tone Parker's at 41, there's zero upside in Parker even, so nothing good there. Frankie Nilakina. He's at 4,700. In fact, the last time he played the Spurs, he put up a remarkable 37 points, considering they're one of the toughest teams for opposition point guards to go against. His minutes are pushing up, but Hornacek just refuses to start him, citing bullshit that's absolutely incorrect. Oh, you know, I really like the way that Nilakina's meshing with the second unit and Jack's meshing with the uh, first unit, even though those two units both have negative net ratings. So I'm not really sure what's happening. I don't know what his 
reluctance is to play Nilakina and Porzingis together big minutes, not like they're the future of the franchise or anything like that. So you might want to see what they can do together. And I believe their net rating together is through the roof. Um, so he's just sticking with whatever stubborn bullshit that he is going with. But Frank does have that upside. We've seen it already against the Spurs. He's averaging 27 over his last three games in general. So there is value there. But in terms of cash, I'm, I'm not feeling it, especially given the matchup. At shooting guard, Manu's at minimum salary. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't, no, don't love it. Dan Green at 4,000. He's been really muted as well since Kawhi Leonard has been back. At small forward, Courtney Lee's at 5,700. He's been putting up just a consistent 27 points over his last five games. And at, at 5,700, on a uh, limited slate, that's not bad to get in there in cash. It's obviously not a great matchup with the lower pace also, but there is, uh, I guess, some value in having him locked in at cash. While Leonard at 7,500, look, I reckon there's a chance he doesn't even play in this game, to be honest. Uh, I think this is the first of a back-to-back. Yes, it is. It's the first of a back-to-back for the Spurs. So uh, he didn't play last time against the Knicks, um, and maybe they think the same thing, and they sit him out and then play him on Wednesday. We will see, but I'm not using him at 7,500. McDirt and Lance Thomas are both minimum salary for a very specific reason, and that is they are bad. Kyle Anderson's at 4,200. He's averaged 23 over his last three. Some extra minutes potentially coming his way with Rudy Gay out, but I don't think there's any ceiling there, and there's actually a pretty low floor, so no interest. While power forward is Kristaps Porzingis, 9,500 for Porzingis. Porzingis. Um, obviously, that's uh, a high price. He had 55 in his last game, but he has struggled uh, previously against the Spurs. I would have no interest in using him in cash, but there is some tournament value with 55 to 60 point upside, but the floor is like 30 points here, and that is a horrible, horrible cash bet, I believe. Mick Beasley, 5,300, really cranking out the numbers. I'm in on Beasley here. I think that he is a great tournament player. I actually think he's not bad for cash, and that is an amazing sentence for me to say at a a Beasley who is over $5,000. Just absolutely, he's putting up the numbers. His last Th- last three games against the Spurs, he averages 38 points. That is as bananas as it gets uh, in only 27 minutes. They're preferring him to uh, McDirt and to and to Lance Thomas. Now, him trying to guard Kawhi could be interesting, but Kawhi's not going to be on the whole game. So there is some value here for Beasley, and I don't think it's a horrible, horrible cash play. I, I, I think there is value there. At center, Ennis Cantor, 5,900. This is not going to be a good matchup for him. I think that's a fade, while Kylo Quinn at 4,200. He's always got the ability to just pop off out of nowhere and put up big ones. That makes him a GPP option, while Powell down to 6,200 now for Powell. I think it's the time to get back onto him. He struggled in that last game, just 19 points, but I think we've got 30 to 35 written all over it. The problem is it's a it's a back-to-back, and a few times this year on the back-to-back, the first half, we've seen Pau Gasol play the first half of, of the game and then not appear at all in the second half. So use him uh, at your peril, especially in cash. I wouldn't want to do that, but for tournaments, it could work, but there is a significant risk involved in using Pau Gasol or any of those Spurs veterans in this sort of a matchup. Uh, on DraftKings, a bit more value over there on DraftKings. Cock at 3,700. Mick Beasley at 46, I think, is really good, as is Frank Nilakina at 43. These are all good tournament options. I love Courtney Lee at 54 for cash. And Aldridge at 7,600. Um, they, there's a chance they could rest Kawhi for this one. I think Aldridge at 76 has that 40-point upside, 45-point upside, which does make him a tournament guy, but I wouldn't want to use him in cash at that salary. While Porzingis... I would use him in cash. Now, given the, the the slate, given the way that the other options look, he's at 8300 on DraftKings, a much more palatable price than what he is on Fangio. So he is a cash option over there. Um, let's go on to the next game now. We're going to talk about the Atlanta Hawks and the Phoenix Suns. If you're watching this game, you're an NBA diehard. The Suns are favored by one and a half, and the total is 218. Mike Muscala has been finally upgraded to probable. I assume that he will come in and cut some minutes off Miles Plumley. It shouldn't have too much of an impact on Ersan Ilyasova. Maybe a couple of minutes. Shouldn't have too much of an impact on the Baptist John Collins. It's more going to be an impact on Plumley. This is the first of a back-to-back for the Suns. So we are on Tyson Chandler watch, although historically he plays the first game and then sits the second one. So I don't think there's any reason to get too cute with a Greggy Munro punt or anything along those lines. Oh, that gives me, uh, gives me an opportunity to play this because I said Greg Munro. As Greg runs in, we realize this could get dangerous. I've got to take full advantage of that, considering he's the only Greg in the NBA and he's not playing enough. 
At point guard, Dennis Schroeder, 7,700. He's been really good lately, averaging 38 points over his last five games. Good matchup for him. Totally in on using him for cash and for tournaments, whereas the Phoenix point guards, Isaiah Cannon, Tyler Eulis, their minutes aren't even going to add up to 48. They're not even splitting that time. There's zero value in either of those guys. The Eulis in his matchup previously against Atlanta, did get 39 points. That was in 40 minutes at the end of last season, and there's no way he's even approaching anywhere near that. At shooting guard, Kent Bazemore, 5,800. I think that's a solid cash play. He's got a good record against Phoenix. He's averaging 27 over the last five, which at 5,800, not a bad cash number. He's not going to play 35 minutes because he just isn't good enough for that, but he is locked in around 28 and can provide defensive numbers, which do provide some value. Well, Devin Booker at 8,000. I love that for Booker. I feel like he's almost a lock for 40. That is a that is one for cash that I'm really, really into very early on. So get onto that. While Marco Ballinelli has been putting up good numbers, 24 average over the last five. He's at 4,200. There is an element of risk with Ballinelli, but I feel all right about him in cash, enabling you to get guys like LeBron in or uh, or throwing in a Devin Booker, getting a Ballinelli in there at that cheap price with a, you know, probably a 20-point floor, maybe an 18-point floor. Not a bad cash type of guy. The artist formerly known as Torian Prince is now up to $6,000 because he has been putting up consistently good name games. I'm not worried about the Suns' defense limiting him. I think that 30 is a realistic expectation, 35 upside, 40 upside. In fact, in his last five games, he had a 50-point game. So he's got good upside for tournaments, and I think he's a relatively safe cash game option, whereas Tony Warren Jr., 7,500, probably a little bit too high, and I'd rather save that money to spend it on guys like Devin Booker. Joshy Jackson's been putrid. Power forwards, Ursan's at 5,700. He's averaging 29 over the last five. He had 32 in the last game. This is a very, very nice matchup for him. Big man power forwards in particular do very well against Phoenix. He's at 5,700. I'm in for that for tournaments. Yeah, 40-point upside here. The floor's probably not as high as you want it to be, but I don't I don't dislike this for cash. Whereas the Baptist at 5,900, well, he can go off for 40, but I, I feel very little confidence at 5,900 for John Collins. Marquise Chris is the other guy that I think you really want to get into your GPPs. He's at 5,300. He's averaging almost 30 points per game over the last three. Has looked much better. There's always the risk with him. That's why I'm not ready to do him for cash. But for tournaments, I'm in on him here with a 30, 35, shit, even 40-point upside for Marquise. At center, Chandler's at 4,500. Played huge minutes in the last two games. For what reason, I've got no idea. I'm off on him here. While Alex Len at 5,000. I think he's a tournament guy here, Lenny. But I obviously wouldn't be looking at him for cash. Miles Plumlee, I wouldn't be looking at anywhere. On DraftKings, for cash and tournaments, Schroeder at 7,300 is super strong. The artist formerly known as Torian Prince is at 5,500. I love that. Well, Ilya Sover at 51. At 51, I can consider Ursan a cash guy as well. And the Baptist comes in super cheap at 4,900. I think that is great for cash. I feel confident about him getting me a 24 to 26 in that range at least. So a strong enough floor to use at that sort of price. While Marquise Chris at 4,600, the same issues as Fangio. We can't trust him. We can't trust the fouls. But the 35, 40 point upside is immense here for Chris. I think he's a very, very strong GPP guy. Devin Booker is too highly priced, I believe, on DraftKings. 9,100 is too high. Sure, in a tournament, but that is too high, I believe, uh, to use him in cash. We've got two more games to go. The Charlotte Hornets and the Sacramento Kings. The Hornets are favored by four, and the total is 206 points. Frank Mason III has been ruled out already. De'Aaron Fox is questionable, and I think that there's about 90% chance that uh, Dave Yeager will unveil yet another starting lineup. In terms of being able to trust anything that Sacramento does, you can't because you don't know what's going to happen on a nightly basis, making you using these guys, apart from a couple, really, really tough. At point guard, we've got Georgie Hills at 4,700. He played only 24 minutes in the last one and scored 12 points, but he's comfortably got 35-point upside, so he's a GPP sort of a guy. Fox at 3,900. Well, we don't know if he'll play, and he'd been you know, pretty piss poor before that, so no. Well, Kemba Walker at 8,000. I like Kemba here. Not like the defense, the 30th-ranked defense in the NBA is going to bother him too much. This feels like almost like a 36, 37-point floor, which is good for cash with some tournament upside. At shooting guard, Bogdan. 4,800. While he's one of two guys who I feel confident with their minutes, I don't know if he'll start. I don't know if he'll come off the bench, but I know he'll get 28 to 30, and he's got that ability to handle the ball with Frank Mason out as well. So I think 25 expectation for Bogdan is not crazy. So I I think he's usable for cash. Probably wouldn't be my first choice, but he is. While Budrick Heald at 4,700, he's got that 40-point upside, makes him a tournament guy, but 
He's a 30-minute guy. He's a 17-minute guy. Who knows? Literally, literally nobody does. 6,400 for Nick Batum, probably a little bit too high. While Jezza Lamb had a big game in the last one, 33 points. He's at 5,600. That's an okay price, but the limited minutes that he gets makes him a tough cash guy to look at. Garrett Temple, Trevion Graham, Malachi Richardson, all shooting guards and all people we don't want to worry about. Michael Kidd-Gilchrist is at 4,700. He has been bad. He's averaging under 20 over the last five, but... His last three games against Sacramento have yielded 33 points on average. The Kings are poor defensively. We know that they allow lots of numbers to small forwards. I think he's worth a GPP because he has these random 20 and 10 nights and has three steals. Just these random out of the blue games that come from nowhere and aren't replicable. And that makes him a shit cash guy, but a really good tournament player to have a look at. Power forward Marvin Williams, look, he has just been as piss poor as piss poor can be. But at 3,700, I think you have to throw him into a GP pool. He's continuing to start at power forward. It's a good matchup against a bad opponent. He could very easily go out there, hit some threes, block two or three shots, have you know, 16 points, and bring back value comfortably. So I think he does have value. But of course, we're not looking at that for cash because he's bad. Well, Zach Randolph at 5,100, the price continues to tumble because his minutes and his production are way down. But he does have that ability to, for Jaeger to go out there and play him 35 random minutes and him to put up 35 points. So he is a tournament guy as well. Frank the Tank also been strong lately. In fact, he's averaging 27 over his last five. He is at 5,200. I think that's not a bad cash play. Just you know, a, a solid-ish floor against a team who, who do allow points to big men. We've seen that time and time again. So there is some cash floor ability there for Frank. Well, Scale Labissier, I don't even know if he'll play. Okay, who knows what's going to happen with Labissier on a game-by-game -game basis. At center, Dwight is up to 8,900. That's super, super high. Great matchup. He's been very, very good recently, averaging 40, uh, 34 over his last five. This is a 40-pointer for Dwight. Um with the limited centers on the slate, yeah, he could be in play here, but I wouldn't be hitching my wagon to him in, in every single lineup. Whereas Corley Stein at 7,100, one of the other two players that you can rely on for consistent minutes. The problem is on Fangio, he's at 7,100, which is pretty high. Now, in saying that, he's averaging 37 over the last five, so there's enough value there. But that is a, a quite high price, and if you don't want to spend up on Dwight, you know, Corley Stein's not a bad option, but the Howard matchup can be a problem. And that that could be a could be an issue for Will when he matches up there. So maybe just look for GPPs, especially with the Jaegering going on. On DraftKings you know, tournaments again, there's a lot of tournament guys. Frank the Tank at 43, Bogdan at 45, Budrick at 45, and Jez Lamb at 52. Awesome tournament value with Bogdan probably being a cash guy as well. And then uh, for cash plays, I like Corley Stein at 65. That's a much more appealing price. Kemba's at 75, and I love that. And Dwight at 74 is ridiculously strong. I love that Howard play at 7,400, one of the best plays on the board on DraftKings. Let's now move on to the last game of the night. It's the Memphis Grizzlies and the LA Clippers. Remember when these games used to be fun? Um, the Clippers are favored by five, and the total is 204.5. Austin Rivers is questionable after missing the last game due to a strained right Achilles. If he is out, then Jawan Evans started that last game, got in some early foul trouble, so we didn't get the full minutes load out of Jawan, but he would be a tournament option. We've seen him have some big games so far this season, but it puts more of a scoring load on Lou Williams. So if Austin's out, then Lou is a guy you can load up. At point guard, Milos is at 5,700, has really been struggling, and I'm not interested in using him here. While Rivers at 5,600, the return of Blake Griffin takes away some of the offensive responsibility from Austin. At 5,600, he still has that ability to go for 40, so I think he'd be a tournament guy, but I wouldn't be feeling super strong about that. While Andy Harrison, Mario Chalmers, Jawan Evans is a guy you would look at uh, if if uh, Austin happens to be out. At shooting guard, Lou Williams, 7,400. Monster in his last game. If Austin is out, that is almost a no-brainer to use Lou. Even if Austin plays, I think at 7,400, you should feel a, a decent level of confidence. Whereas Tyreek is at 9,000. That is just stupendously high. It's a good spot for Tyreek. Uh, it's a good matchup. He's on a really good form, averaging 48 over the last five. I just don't feel super confident with that salary there. You bring him in at 8,500. I'd be all about Tyreek. 9,000, probably a little bit too high. So I've had no problem with his consistency. His floor is 41 points minimum over the last five, which is tremendous. But I just think that on Fangio, that price is just a little bit too high. CJ Williams likely to get another start. He's a minimum salary player. He had 20 points the last time they went up against uh, Memphis but I don't think that you should be expecting uh, high output from C.J. Williams. 
at uh, other small forward, Dylan Brooks, no. Wes Johnson, they're both minimum, no. Slam and Sammy Decker, minimum, no. And Jim Ennis at 3,800. None of those guys really appeal. If I'm going to use one of them, it's probably Decker. But even then, I don't really see too much there. Whereas power forward is Blake Griffin. He's been monstrous since returning. Had 47 in his last game. He's at 9,000. He's been very good against the Grizzlies in the past. Jermichael Green, Jarrell Martin, Ennis. None of these guys are going to be able to really slow down Blake. I like him a lot at 9,000. The knee injury is not bothering him, clearly. Forgot to mention that Chandler Parsons is out also for, uh, for the Grizz. Jermichael Green's at 4,200. That is a hard pass from me. Well, Jarrell Martin at 42. I don't mind Martin in cash. It is, it is risky considering we don't know how his minutes are going to be, but he's been pretty good lately. Um, very limited tournament upside, though. Whereas the table, Montrez Harrell, big game in the last one for Montrez. Actually, that's not true. He had only nine points in the last one. The game before that, he was pretty big. Um, with Blake back, it is tough to see him getting enough playing time. At center, Marc Gasol v. DeAndre Jordan. Gasol's at 8,200 and Jordan at 75. Give me DeAndre for that cheaper salary. Gasol's inefficiency so far this season has been a real problem. He's averaging 32 over his last three, which is not enough at 8,000. Uh, 200. Hopefully, Jordan can get some blocks in and put some pressure on. He's been a little bit down in that area also. But I, I do like both of them, and, and I, I'd favor DeAndre in this matchup. Deontay Davis playing some pretty good numbers or minutes lately, averaging 22 across his last three. Uh, Brandon Wright sort of being phased out in preference, or so Davis getting the preference. He is a guy that can block four or five shots in limited minutes and and, and score efficiently. So he does have the you know, 25, 30-point upside, which is not bad at that salary. I wouldn't feel super strong. It's more of a differentiator in a multi-lineup setup for uh, GPPs. Let's now flick it to DraftKings. Some cash options here that I like a lot. DeAndre at 74, Lou Williams at 75, Tyreek at 82 is super strong on DraftKings, and Blake Griffin I love at 8,400. Much cheaper prices for both Blake and Tyreek, even relative to uh, the salary cap differential. I like both of those guys over on DraftKings. Austin Rivers is too high. I wouldn't have any interest there. CJ Williams at 36 is too high. There's, there's not much else that I really enjoy uh, with the DraftKings situation for this game. All right, let's uh, wrap it up by looking through the other sites. Yahoo for GPPs. It's Gasol. It's Nurkic. It's formerly. It's Ilya Sova, Chris Bogdan Bogdanovich, Georgie Hill, Budrick, Cock, Jarrell Martin as your tournament plays. For cash, it's Ballinelli, it's Tyson Chandler, Frank Kaminsky, Frank Nilakina, Kemba Walker, and Dwight Howard. On Moneyball for tournaments, Tyreek, Yusuf Nurkic, The Baptist, Ilyasova, Chris Kid Gilchrist, Nilakina, Starvin Marvin. And for cash, we've got Ballinelli, Kaminsky, Bogdan, Bazemore, formerly Courtney Lee, Lou Williams, Dennis Schroeder, Kemba Walker, Blake Griffin, Dwight Howard, Porzingis, and LeBron. And on Draft Stars for tournaments, Dwight, Porzingis, Griffin, Prince, Aminu, Ilyasova, Budrick, Kid Gilchrist, JR, The Plumber, Smith. And for cash, we've got Ballinelli, Nilakina, Kaminsky, Chris, Bogdanovich, Georgie Hill, The Baptist, Corley Stein, Lou Williams, Jordan, Schroeder, Walker, Tyreek, and... All right, that does it. Thought it was going to be a short show, but I rambled about shit for way too long, so I do apologize about that. If you like the rambling, or if you listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, go and leave a five-star review. And of course, you can find this show on Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and Spotify. And of course, on YouTube, where you can subscribe, leave a thumbs up, and leave a comment. Find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore b My name is Josh Lloyd, the lead fantasy analyst at Basketball Monster. And we are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Davon Reed.